Hello, I'm Simon Owens, and you're listening to The Business of Content, a podcast about how publishers create, distribute, and monetize their digital content. In this week's episode, we're talking about a company that scaled local newsletters to five cities. Every morning, tens of thousands of people who live in cities like Miami, Portland, and Pittsburgh receive a conversational email that updates them on the latest news within their city. These newsletters don't often contain any original reporting, but they've been embraced by their local communities because they're so effective at distilling dozens of newspaper articles, social media posts, and government announcements into an easy-to-read digest. These newsletters are owned and operated by a company called Where By Us. Launched in 2014, the company built out a scalable model that includes newsletters, self-service ads, and paid memberships. I recently interviewed its founder, Christopher Sofer, about how he built the company, its role within local journalism, and why he decided to spin off a SaaS publishing product that he sells to other media entrepreneurs. Before we jump into the interview, I want to talk about my Substack newsletter. Last week, I published a 1,500-word deep dive into how a venture capitalist grew her newsletter to over 100,000 subscribers. We walked through her growth strategies, business model, and ambitions to expand the newsletter into a full-fledged media company. There's only one way to access case studies like this, and it's by becoming a subscriber to my Substack newsletter. Go to simonowens.substack.com. That's simonowens.substack.com. Or just Google the words Simon Owens and newsletter. Okay, on to my interview with Christopher. Hey, Christopher, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Uh, so we're here to talk about your your current company, but like, what was your background prior to launching Where By Us? I, right before we launched the company, I worked at a place called Knight Foundation that does a lot of investing and grant making in journalism, uh, media, technology, local communities, and did both investing and grant making there around journalism and, and new media projects. And then before that, I worked in a couple of different roles around product research and design and helping companies figure out how to make news products in particular that would appeal to young people, which was the trend of the moment at the time. And uh, all of that led us to where about us. And so you had a little bit of background in product, but you're not like a programmer or anything like that. Not since I was in high school. Uh, my my programming stopped with Visual Basic, so I'm of I'm of no use to our uh, to our coding team at this point. So what was kind of the stuff that? So you you so you were at Knight Foundation. Knight obviously you know gives grants and stuff to a lot of newsy type startups. So you were kind of in that news startup environment. I'm guessing. How did you start coming up with the idea for what became Where by Us? It started as a community project, actually, and not something that had to do with media. Um, one of the things I used to do when I worked there was we would go around to different cities and promote this contest we ran called the night news challenge. And the news challenge would have a theme every time. And we would give about $5 million each time to different projects. Some of them were tech, some of them were startups that we would invest in. Some of them were nonprofits uh, that were working on that challenge. And we did one on open government. And this is in 2013, 2012, we did one on open government and we would do events in different cities, including all the cities where Knight Foundation has a big presence. And we did one in Miami and it was uh, sort of l- latched on to the launch of this co-working space called Lab Miami that was like one of the first co-working spaces to open in in Miami with a focus on the startup community. And uh, there were like 400 people that came out to this event. And the topic was how can we make Miami government better, make, make Miami a better place to live through open government, which is perhaps the least sexy topic you could imagine for getting people to come and spend part of a Saturday. But the turnout was insane. And we had these little group facilitated sessions where people would get together and talk about ideas and brainstorm together. It's like a fun kind of collaborative session. And it was all about promoting this contest to get people to submit their ideas and their projects so we could uh, potentially fund some of them. And at the end of the event, I had all these people coming up to me afterward going like, that was awesome. When's the next one? Like, we're going to do this every month? And I'm like, no, this is not something we're going to do every month. But it, it kept turning over my head and I kept hearing from people who were like, that was really fun. We should get together again. And that's sort of where the inspiration for Where By Us came from. Like, what does it look like to get a lot of people together to talk about their city and have these interesting collaborative kind of design thinking sessions around different topics? And we did one of those a month for about a year. And... Our initial idea at the the Knight Foundation, you're saying? Well, actually, I sort of took it to the side from Knight Foundation and not really Mm -hmm. part of their programming. Um, The Miami Foundation uh, supported us with a grant to let us do this work and and engage different community groups and so forth in these projects. We did all kinds of topics. We did everything from like parking to health. Uh, And 
over the course of that, the initial idea uh, that I came up with was to actually start like a civic incubator. Um, but it became pretty, pretty clear pretty quickly that there was this opportunity around news and information because every single month we would do this event and people would always pitch ideas that were about news and information and learning what was going on in the community and creating calendars and newsletters and websites. And, and so myself and Bruce and Rebecca, my two co-founders who I'd roped into helping me with this amorphous thing, we looked at each other and we're like, we know about media. People keep mentioning that there's not enough local news, not enough local media to help them get plugged into the city, even though there's a big newspaper and there's TV stations and the radio station, all this stuff. So that's weird. And we went out and did a research project to learn what it was like to live in Miami and why people were saying that. We followed people around on their commutes in the morning. We went to happy hour with people. We literally like tagged along like weird over the shoulder, fly on the wall kind of thing in different people's lives for a day or a few hours and just immersed ourselves in different types of experience. And we saw, yeah, people really aren't plugged into what's going on. They're not checking in on a regular basis with what's happening. And we saw email as a particularly great opportunity given the way we all use email and and how prevalent it is and, and how direct that relationship could be. So that's actually where the initial idea for Where By Us and our first media brand, the Nootropic, came from. Uh, and, and we got focused on that media opportunity uh, after that. You know, initially we wanted to open a bar and do all these other kinds of things, but we cut that out of the business plan as we did our research and learned, okay, this can be an email first product. That's where we're going to make the biggest impact. And were you from Miami or was it just like a coincidence that like you just had a really successful event in Miami and that's where you kind of focused? I, I'm not from Miami originally. I grew up in DC, in, uh, in DC area, and I moved from DC down to, uh, to Miami in 2012 to work at Knight Foundation. And just really quickly, it got connected to this kind of growing ecosystem of people who were in Miami, excited about what was going on. There was all this kind of raw energy and people were really eager to connect. It was really open, right? People's networks were really open. You'd meet one person and they'd introduce you to 20 more people. It was this really kind of fluid thing that made it really easy to get excited about about being there, different than than some of the aspects of DC culture uh, in, in several ways. And that was really addicting, I think. And I, I met a lot of folks who grew up in Miami who were back or who were kind of reinvesting in it in this moment and a lot of newcomers who were also really excited to be there. And and it's funny now because Miami tech is this whole trendy thing and uh, it's the new startup capital or whatever, <laughs> depending on the news you read. And some of that is real, but what's, what's really cool about it is that people are um, actually like that's been around for a decade. You know, there was a moment similar to this one 10 years ago that, that the city was going through. And so that's kind of what led us to this in the first place. And, and I think as, as transplants, as people who were new to the city, we were able to see it in kind of a different way than somebody who grew up there had seen it. And we tried to smash those two things together and kind of see what came out the other side. And when did you launch this Miami publication and who wrote it? We launched it on January 5th, 2015, and Rebecca and Bruce and I wrote it. Um, we, we wrote the newsletter every day. We uh, worked on a lot of content with a lot of freelancers and local writers that we brought in to help us produce different content. We did events. Um, we did uh, video content. We did stuff on the website. We did kind of a complete uh, thing. But yeah, it was the three of us originally. We produced it every day and uh, a lot of days falling asleep at the computer trying to get, get the newsletter done um, at a reasonable hour, by which I mean like you know midnight or 1 a.m. So that was how it started. And it goes out every morning, right? And it's supposed to be kind of like a news digest that if you live in Miami, you can subscribe to this, read it once a day, and then have a general idea of what is happening in your area, right? Exactly. That's how we thought of the newsletter. One of the things that we that we did initially was try to think about what we were building from the value it would bring to the reader more so than what it was as a piece of media. Uh, so internally, you don't find a lot of documents like in our company that are like, oh, we make a daily news digest email newsletter that, you know, you read like as you described it, your description is very good, but we actually don't write it down that way very often. That is what we make, but it's not why we make it, right? So the thing that we put at the center of it is we're trying to help people connect to the city, feel like they live there, feel like they're good at being a local, feel like they can discover new stuff, feel like they can celebrate the things that they like and find new stuff that they didn't know existed. These are the things that we are doing and why we're doing that. And the newsletter is one of the tools for that. But that was something we, it took us a while to figure this out. But one of the things that 
we found early on was readers would tell us, hey, I really love this. They'd refer people. We, we had these strong open rates and we wanted to know, well, why? Like, what are we doing right? And one of the things people would, would tell us is like, it feels like a community or it feels like I'm a part of this thing. It's more than just some words that are delivered to my inbox. And that's a super amorphous thing, easy to say, hard to identify, uh, hard to measure, but it was something that really seemed to power all that early uh, love we got. And so we tried to kind of put that up on the pedestal instead of saying, this is a newsletter business saying like, there's a community business and email is just a really awesome tool for that. Um, so that was one of the things we tried to be really intentional about with, you know, ourselves. And as we brought new people onto the team, educating them and, and bringing them into the mission of what we were trying to do. And how did it find an audience? Like when you were looking at your analytics, where were the new subscribers coming from? Well, it definitely started as our mom and dads and aunts and friends and so forth who we roped into reading it like everything does, right? But the initial sort of people who, who supported it were people around the community, sort of. We, we call these people curious locals in our internal lingo, but just people who are like active around Miami. And we had met a lot of people by that point, done all this research, done all these events. Those were the people that we sent the initial product to. And, and that was intentional on our part. Like we wanted people who were engaged and active and out there spending time being involved in the city. We were not trying to build a thing for everyone. We were not trying to replicate the newspaper. We we're not trying to sort of reach a general audience. It was for a very specific group of people in Miami who were interested in like spending time out there in the city. And that was less demographic to us than it was behavioral. So we didn't care what age you were. We would have these events that were, you know, we'd have 19 year olds and we'd have 89 year olds showing up to the events that we did. And that's also intentional, right? We're looking for a behavioral thing, which is like people who want to be out there exploring the city. Um, and it just sort of spread by word of mouth in those first couple of months. And the audience was small, right? We went to a thousand, 5,000, about three months in, we hit 10,000 readers. And that was where the business started to really take off. Three months in, you said? Yeah, about three, like three and a half months in. Oh, wow. And so you, and you built your own tech, right? Like, was that from the very beginning or did you start, did you do just do cobbling things together with the, for an MVP and then started building out your own technology after that? We started cobbling things together, I think, as we learned now at doing letterhead. Everyone does that, right? There, there's no one who's who's doing any business in this space, particularly an email, who's just like, oh, I'm just using this one thing, right? Um, it's all cobbled together in different ways. And in some ways, that's good. And in some ways, that's really annoying. But that's what we did as well. We started with MailChimp. We did WordPress. Uh, there was a lot of copy pasting. There was a lot of Google Docs. There was a lot of uh, fixing HTML code at, at 11 at night, a lot of this kind of stuff. And that was what initially led us to start building some of our own tech. My co-founder, Rebecca, who has a product and engineering background, obviously tends to look at some problems as software problems. And one of the first ones was that we were booking a lot of small dollar ad revenue. So we had passed 10,000 readers and we were meeting a lot of local businesses and some of them were bigger sponsors who did bigger projects with us, but we would meet a lot of businesses that were doing, you know, 300, 400, $500 ad budgets, thousand dollar ad budgets, these kind of small scale uh, projects where they had, you know, 250 bucks a month for the year that they wanted to advertise and they wanted to work with our audience, but they were so small in budget that it just didn't make financial sense for us to spend as a team of, at that point, four people, we hired one person to, to manage all those relationships. It was like so much work that it almost wasn't worth it. And so we said, all right, well, there's got to be a way to simplify that process and let people book ads in our newsletter and provide their own creative uh, into the system and have that automatically run in our newsletter. We ought to be able to do that without, um, you know, without sort of having to it all be manual. And so that was the first thing we wrote code to help us do. Uh, and then we built our own newsletter builder to help us actually write and create the content because we we're trying at that point to figure out how do we scale this thing to other cities? What's what's working? What's too expensive? What's too slow? And one of the things we found was we were spending multiple hours a day on like dumb layout and, and the sort of visual block based builder kind of problems that were just like not productive at all. Um, and we're like, there's got to be a better way to do that, too. And so that's what led us to create our own newsletter builder. So that was really the beginning of our in-house technology. You know, the self-service thing, it like, it's still, this is a rant that I go on regularly is still boggles the mind that most journalism outlets never built any kind of self-service capability into it. Like if I wanted to advertise on Facebook or Google AdWords or anything like that, I could do it within minutes without having much prior knowledge. But if I wanted to hire, if I wanted to advertise on like CNN or New York Times, like even the fact that I, you know, run a publishing industry newsletter and podcast, I couldn't tell you how to do it. I would have to spend several 
hours researching. I would probably have to go through an ad salesperson, either at one of those publishers or someone who works in media buying and ad tech and stuff like that. It just seems like the industry just never really caught on to that as a priority, right? Uh, absolutely. I, I should uh, I should clip this out of the podcast for us. I think that's a great <laughs> description of, of why we started working on Letterhead to sort of take that those tools and open them up to other publishers. It, because we have made a, a lot of revenue over the years, right? The, the Whereby Us business now, we have five cities. It does about a million and a half dollars in revenue every year. And 40, 45% of our revenue comes from newsletter advertising that is either sold directly through self-service or at least facilitated by our software. And it's done, we have a two person sales team and a one account manager. And uh, I'm sure they would love more capacity on their team, but there's absolutely no way they could manage a book of business that big without software, right? Which is not patting ourselves on the back. It's just like, it's a software problem. We happen to have a a potential solution to that. But I agree with you, absolutely. I, I think one reason for that is that uh, a lot of the local in particular, like local and smaller advertisers, they're either not super tech savvy. And so there's a hesitancy about like how comfortable are they going to be buying their own ads? And, you know, it, it's pretty hard to be good at Facebook ads or Google ads. It's, it's easy to do it, but it's hard to like really excel at it and get the most optimized stuff. That's what people hire firms for. And then also there's a lot of ad buying with like governments and big companies and so forth that's still done through media agencies. And so I think and we've heard that sometimes, right, about why people are hesitant for self-service. But we're starting to see this shift in the market where a lot of publishers are realizing, one, and most advertisers at this point have been trained to look at self-service as an option or at least know that it's available. Like, hey, things could be easier, right? Like they, they know that now. And so if you're not making it easier, you're behind the market, right? And, and why? Like, why do that to yourself? And two, you can open up new revenue channels, right? Like we always talk about, oh, classifieds went away and that killed the, the news industry at the local level, right? And the story's not that simple, of course. But, you know, you can reopen the classified business if you want to, right? In your, in your local product, if you have the right software for it. But I think the other problem has been doing that on the web with websites is really tough because of how massive and sort of difficult to locate the numbers are around web traffic and so forth at a smaller scale, right? Everything's just so massive around web traffic and there's all these issues around reliability and what's a bot and all this sort of stuff. Email doesn't have a lot of those problems. And so that's the other thing that gets us excited about email. It's like, it's much, much easier to have a kind of tighter universe with less uh, out floating out there, easier to contain and track and build when you're doing a channel like email that's direct than when you're doing it on the web. So I think that's another way you can kind of open up that revenue channel for a lot of publishers. And what's that process look like for buying the ad? Like I'm guessing, <clears throat> here's my guess is I see it. I see an ad in one of your newsletters and then it's like, it has some kind of call to action. Like want to want to place an ad like this, click here, takes me to a landing page that has some basic stats about who I'm reaching and then I can enter my credit card and then there's maybe a form I fill out that ha- that limits number of characters and all that kind of stuff so that my ad fits whatever the confines of the parameters that you set. Is it, is it that easy? Exactly. That's our goal is to make it that easy. And we like to say it's easier than buying a Facebook or Google ad. And, you know, whether that's true depends on what type of advertiser you are. But the idea is that it's it's equally or easier, right? Some of those online ad platforms, they actually require you to have sort of a a high level of sophistication, right? Like what's the bid you want on this? What's the attribution time frame you want on this? And if you've not done that before or aren't an expert, you're looking at the glossary a lot, right? I've I've been there myself. Um, Or you're hiring somebody to do it for you, or you're sort of like sticking your budget in there and being like, well, I hope this works, but I don't totally understand all the fine fine, um, print and, and finer points of this, right? Meanwhile, somebody who does can come in there and lap you. So there are some real challenges, I think, for small and medium brands and advertisers in, in some of those big platforms. Um, and so our goal is to make it easier than that for those kind of advertisers where one, our system currently, we do everything by calendar. So it's all placement based and CPM, you can do CPM pricing or flat pricing but you're booking dates, right, in the newsletter. We're working on some new stuff around booking ads that are like pay-per-conversion and and pay-per-click and things like that, Um, because obviously there is demand for those as well. But our goal is to start with something really simple, which is like I'm sponsoring or putting an ad in this newsletter on this date or this series of dates Um, is really easy for a lot of smaller and medium-sized advertisers to uh, plan around because that's how they think about their budget. Um, And then you put in your creative and then the publisher gets to review and approve that copy before it goes live, which is something we also 
heard from a lot of publishers like, Hey, I've thought about doing this, but I'm worried about, you know, what if I get spam ads in there or stuff that doesn't meet my terms or stuff that has hate speech in it or, you know, what have you, which unfortunately is very common. Uh, so that's why we put a review and approval, uh, process in it as well. But yeah, that's our goal. Make it super simple. And so you can turn on this new revenue channel without having to like build out a whole team and dedicate all this resource to it. Yeah, I don't know. This might, I think I had him on my podcast, and this might be before your time. I think you're a little younger than me, but there was this guy named Henry, or he's still alive, Like, so I'm not going to talk about him in past tense. Henry Blodgett, he started a website or a platform called Blog Ads in the early 2000s. Yeah, absolutely. You, you know of it? I know of it. Yeah, and it's basically was self service blog advertising, and it was brilliant. I could have, you know, anybody could easily. They know the exact rate, what the traffic was for the thing. They they you know do it. It goes to the blogger for approval, and then it's up on the website. And he, you know, he he kind of invented native advertising before you know Facebook, or I don't know if it predated Google's AdWords, but totally. like it was very early to the game. And then it just ne- like programmatic advertising came, and his like, he, and then everybody just moved away from what he was doing. And it's just amazing that that uh, that level of functionality is no longer on the internet outside of the large platforms. So you also built out like a membership uh, capabilities too. How does that work? Yeah, I, I think membership, similar to the advertising, as, as you're saying, it, our industry works in these cycles, right? Just like the fashion industry. You know, well, I talked to my dad uh, a few months ago and he's like, you know, I see everyone wearing all these skinny ties now right? and uh, yeah. I shouldn't have thrown out all my skinny ties from the 60s because they had this cool collection of like classic skinny ties that now would be in fashion. But then the 70s and 80s came around and they weren't in fashion anymore. But it all comes around eventually. Right. I, I think our industry works in that way, too, in, in such a such a huge way. And uh, people find that annoying. But I think it's nice to know that that's going to happen. So, you know, blog ads came around. There was this era. Now we're back to the blog. Right. I mean, you have all these technologies for writers that are basically that. Yeah. Again, in new formats, which is awesome. Like, that's good. I, I think that's healthy. Uh, so membership, I think, is the same thing, right? You have folks who are doing donation-based NPR style, you know, become a member, support our work. You have people who are doing straight donations, like just, hey, if you can chip in some money, like chip in some money, more Patreon style. You have people who are doing actual, uh, you know, it's paid only. It's the information, things like that. Like You have to have a subscription. You have people who are doing, uh, you know, these kind of freemium models where you get one thing for free and then if you pay, you get extra. There's all these different permutations of it. But one of the things that we saw a lot of people doing was using email as a key part of that funnel. Every customer we work with is different in where that all lives, right? Some people, the email is the product. For other people, it's, you know, a lead generation for a membership program that kind of lives somewhere else. Um, we have like one, we have one customer where it's all about events and the newsletter is a free thing. And if you pay, you get access to these in-person, well, now virtual events. So there's different ways you can do it. But one of the things we saw was that email was always in there somewhere in somebody's strategy. Um, and what we see increasingly is that people are putting that newsletter, you know, at the center or bottom of that funnel. Like it is, it is one of the core products. And when it is one of your core products, you you look at it differently than almost every piece of email software to date thinks of, of the product, right? Like when you talk about a MailChimp or, uh, you know, constant contact or like one of these other tools, like these are marketing tools. They're about managing a list and sending email to it that converts people to somewhere else to buy a product or click on a website or whatever, right? They've, they've checked out on your site and now they get an email. It's all this sort of transactional and marketing stuff. It's not actually about engaging someone in the inbox. That's relatively new as a core piece of the business strategy for a lot of different companies, which in- includes, but is not limited to publishers. That's the key kind of change there. And I think membership is a great example of that. So yeah, we, we built out some membership tooling as well, um, initially in-house for all of our brands. And, and now we're making that part of Letterhead. And then we also integrate with um, some you know outside uh, sort of membership tools. And, and we're working on some, some new partnerships in that area as well. Like uh, for our, our brands, actually, we use Pico as our membership provider and then integrate that with Letterhead in, in uh, some fun ways. So we're hoping to do that for more of our customers because there's a lot of cool stuff out there in the membership space already. And our goal is not to like replicate that, but rather to you know help plug in and, and facilitate that for people who are publishing newsletters. And for the sake of my listeners who are listening now, I know that he keeps on referencing this thing called letterhead and you're like, what the hell is that? We're going to get to that. Um, but anyway, uh, so in, in terms of like, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, your owned and operated newsletters, what are you offering paying members? 
Yeah, so we do a freemium model. We have the daily newsletter that is free for everybody. And then if you become a member, we do a special content section in each newsletter that's just for members. And then we do different kinds of virtual events and giveaways and programming uh, for members. There was, frankly, a lot more uh, happening around the membership program pre-COVID, and we're excited to kind of get back to that. Uh, but we used to do a lot of events, a lot of meetups, tours, different kinds of tickets and access that we would get members around town. So a lot of it was about kind of local community, exploring the city, things like that. But that was really what we focused on with the membership program. We had to move a lot of that virtual. A lot of people went through that. Um, but we actually saw our membership roles like more, a little more than tripled uh, in 2020 because we went out to the community. And we said, hey, you know, this membership program is really uh, important to these brands right now, given COVID and the advertising market had a couple of months where things were slow. Uh, now, now they're back stronger than they were. But that, during that couple of months, we saw a ton of growth and support from our readers and uh, through that membership program. So one of the things we're really excited to do is kind of get back out, be being more active with those programs around the, around the cities uh, so that members are kind of getting getting those around town benefits, which were really the core of the program. Uh, so you so you started in Miami in 2015. When did you start launching in other cities? We launched our second city in August of 2016 in Seattle, and that's called the Evergrey, that brand. That we launched with uh, Monica Guzman and Annika Nand, who are now off doing other cool things, but they spent uh, about four years building uh, the Evergrey with us. And we had figured out how to make this model profitable, and we thought we knew a bunch of the operational things we'd need to do to do it in more than one place, which... I think is where we saw a lot of people stumbling. Like th around that time, there were a lot of other new local things popping up, which is awesome. Now there are even more, which is even more awesome. Uh, but one of the places we saw people uh, stumbling was sort of, okay, I got this right in one market. And then I went to the second market and X, Y, Z, right? I couldn't raise enough money. It was too expensive. Uh, I couldn't get enough revenue. It grew too slowly, whatever. And so we said, hey, we think we know some of the tech ops sales kind of things that it's going to take to do this in more than one place. And you know your city and the content you want to make and so forth. And, you know, we had become increasingly interested in the unsexy stuff, the ops, the sales, uh, those kinds of things more than in the, the content itself. So it felt like exactly the right kind of meeting of the minds for us to be able to give them a salary and budget to work with and room to kind of build their thing, but inside a model where they knew there was some stability to it and not have to figure all that out from square one. So we did that in Seattle with them. They were able to grow it super quickly. It, it got profitable even faster than the new Tropic. And then in 2018, we launched in Portland and Orlando, sort of expanding out geographically from those two coasts. And then in 2019, we bought uh, the Incline from Spirited Media, which was shutting down uh, in Pittsburgh and brought them into the fold. And those are the five that we have uh, now. And, uh, you know, we were sort of building those up. And then in 2020, when COVID hit, uh, we started working on Letterhead, uh, something we were already planning to do, but we started working on it during during COVID to uh, take advantage of that opportunity to kind of launch a new business uh, alongside it. So it does, I looked at like several of the newsletters. It doesn't seem like the newsletters are doing much in terms of like original reporting. It's more kind of curation. Do you think original reporting could ever really fit into your business model? Like, do you think you could grow to be to, you know, one day replace, you know, either all or part of like the functionality of a traditional newspaper? It's not what we're doing. I do think there are email led products that could and maybe should exist in different cities that do a lot of original reporting, but it's, it's not what we're focused on. And I think it took us a while to get comfortable saying that because there's so much prizing in the journalism community, rightly so, of original reporting, the shoe leather, the investigative work, these kinds of things, right? I think the way we interpret it typically in our industry is someone, journalists at organizations or independently, but produce reporting content, news stories. And then that sort of is the foundation on which all these other things are built, right? That curated and, and so on and so forth. If you don't have that original reporting, the community is going to really struggle. I buy that up until a point because I, I don't think it is how people who live in cities think about the community they live in. And that's only one part of the equation. Like I believe in the importance of the stuff to democracy as much as the next person in our space. But I think folks think of it as, you know, is my city headed in the right direction? Do I understand how to get involved in that in the ways I care about? Uh, I care about this particular issue. Is anything being done on that? Oh, that's interesting. I wasn't expecting to read about that today. Like there are all these sort of more practical day-to-day -day things that 
people are looking for out of quote unquote local news and information. And sometimes I think we mistake the hard reporting investigative value prop of journalism, which is totally one of them for the entire thing. And that's not to say, Hey, we're doing everything the the Miami or Seattle or, you know, whatever community needs, like for sure, if those newspapers went out of business tomorrow, that would be a huge loss to the community. Um, But I, I think there's an extent to which sometimes in trying to solve this problem, we start with how are we going to have enough local reporting? And in some ways, I think that actually makes it harder to find successful models for local reporting um, because we haven't started with the user and what they're looking for and how do we create a good experience for them and with the business. We've started with, well, we must have a certain amount of local reporting articles per week or day or whatever. And I'm not sure I buy that part of it, right? So no, I don't think it's what we are doing. However, I think if somebody wanted to build an original reporting driven model, you could totally pick a lot of the pieces up that we are using, right? Email, super low cost, high touch platform. You can pair that with social. There are self-service ads and underwriting you can do, memberships to support it. There are ways that you can do this. And there are people in the space who are doing that. Like what the American Journalism Project is doing, uh, funding a ton of new local and existing local uh, nonprofit newsrooms. I think is really powerful. And they think of it in this kind of product led way that is really smart. They say, oh, well, you know, can we get someone to start with a minimum viable thing, right? What's the minimum viable level of journalism a community needs? And how do we do that in the fastest, lowest cost way possible and then build on top of it? I think that's the right mentality. And that's been our mentality with our products, which are much more about kind of community and belonging and so forth. So there are totally people, another way of saying this, there are totally people in the space and in our local cities who have looked at our brands kind of sideways and said like, ah, you know, these are, they're too positive or it's not hard reporting or whatever, right? We've totally run into some of that skepticism from the traditional part of the industry. Um, you know, we don't care a ton about that uh, because I think our function is just different, but I, I absolutely think someone could take a lot of those pieces of the model and apply it to a reporting driven focus and be able to get the numbers to work, right? Um, and, and be able to get the PL to whether it's nonprofit or for profit to work, which is the problem that so many folks have run into. Yeah, I mean, I got my start in, in, new, in local newspapers back in like 2006. And, you know, a huge part of my job was going to the board. Like I worked on a team with a few other reporters, like two. Uh, it was me, another reporter my age, and then the editor who also did a lot of reporting herself. And we covered like three counties and someone was assigned each month to go to this board of supervisors meeting. Someone was assigned to go to this town council meeting. Someone was assigned, assigned to go to the school board, the monthly school board meeting and i guess like the worry is is like is there a business model for that type of you know having reporters actually show up to these government meetings are you you so you're optimistic that there there's still going to be a model for that and not just a bunch of not to to belittle what you do but i see a lot of these aggregator newsletters like 6 a.m city is another one and i guess there, there is this worry and perhaps i would account myself among them is like is there a business model though for something that's a little bit more you know doing that traditional journalism Absolutely. I don't think that's belittling what we do at all, right? I mean, we we very deliberately are not doing that thing that is super critical for communities, right? Um, We're a for-profit company. Part of our goal is like, how do we build a a profitable business here, right? And I don't think that's oppositional to original reporting necessarily, but just now we've chosen to do. And, you know, sort of having talked through where we came from, right? That's just embedded in our thing from the beginning. It's not like we set out to be like, how do we provide more original investigative, you know, local accountability journalism? And we pivoted because we couldn't make it work. It's just never been our, our goal um, because we were interested in why are people living in a place they seem to like it, but they don't feel connected to what is happening. Like that is the problem that I am interested in solving that I think a lot of our team members are interested in solving. I think it is related in that um, you could have a million reporters at every local meeting of any body, right? In every community, which has never happened, right? But you could have like a hundred percent reporter penetration at, at the local level everywhere. And if you don't have the engagement and the participation, the feeling like, Hey, I have agency, I have power. I can show up and play a role in what happens next. If you don't have those other elements, 
it, sort of useless, right? It's the it's the the tree falls in the forest problem, and there are many different opinions about this, right? Mine is uh, it is not worth doing if you are shouting to no one, um, and that's not to say that people who are doing investigative journalism today are shouting to no one. But I think you it's an ecosystem, it's a web, right? I don't view it as this foundation, like original reporting on the bottom, and then you build on top. I view it as it's literally a web and you in a cycle for people, and you have to have every part of the cycle. And so our business. Could it exist without like local newspapers and original reporting? Like probably, but would it be as good or as effective? Would we be as good at solving the problem we want to solve? No way, right? And vice versa. Like we we send tens of thousands of clicks a month to local newspapers in our cities, right? We convert people into subscriptions. We've gotten a lot of reader feedback. Like, hey, I went and signed up for a Miami Herald subscription because I kept hitting the paywall from your newsletter. So you know, we're delighted to do that, right? Like, excellent. That's that's how it should work, right? It's this kind of symbiosis. But I think that's the key thing is that, unfortunately, in our space, there's a lot of scarcity that's been beaten into us by the economy of, of media. Um, and a lot of thinking of like, it's zero sum. And if another thing pops up, this other thing loses. And I just don't think that's true, um, regardless of, of the product, right? Like, the thing I would say about something like 6am city, like we know those guys, you know, sure, the brands are all the same. It's a lot of aggregation, et cetera. But they are, they are, they have the attention and engagement every day of a generation and group of people who are not engaged with the traditional metro newspaper because the traditional metro newspaper sucks at serving those people. This is where I started my career doing like young people in media stuff. And so I think they're, they're actually serving this really valuable connection function. And if I'm putting on my cynical hat about the industry, I would say, it is the legacy media uh, publishers that have really struggled to be open-minded about that and to figure out, well, how do we take what we do best and plug it into all these new things that are happening? There's there's a way in which we become defensive in our space. I saw this when I worked in the grant making and investing side, and we want to circle the wagons, right? Like, hey, like there's new people coming. How do we protect our turf? And I think it's the wrong way to to approach what is happening because you know, look at the numbers, right. For a lot of these, these brands. Um, and there's a lot of smart people that are trying to do the right thing. Right. But there's some, some overarching business things above them that make it really tough. And, uh, that kind of circle the wagons mentality, I think can be, can be harmful in the long run, figuring out how do we solve the real problem and kind of make it go. Um, but I also think, you know, some of that is going to get broken up anyway, right? You have investigative reporters and stuff who are running like sub stacks and starting their own thing and, you know, going and starting a new nonprofit and getting funding from someone like American Journalism Project or Lion or whatever. And I, I think that's good. Like our view on this is that there should be 50,000 of these things in every market, whether it's a geography or some other slice of the world, demographic or some topical vertical. There should be a lot more of them, right? I don't want the nootropic to be the biggest news source in Miami. I think that's a vanity exercise. I want there to be a hundred nootropics in South Florida for different slices of the community. And 50 of them, 80 of them might fail over time. Okay, right. But but some of those are gonna survive and you're gonna have this diverse ecosystem. Like I really do think we need a lot more boats in the water. Um, that's That's my lens on it, right? I think a lot of money gets wasted trying to prop up um, legacy publications in the way they used to look. And I think we'd have a much better chance of saving a lot of those brands and the important work they do if we weren't so worried about trying to restore what was and we spent a lot more time thinking about where we can go. And I think that applies to those legacy businesses as well. So you did something that I'm seeing more and more media companies do in the sense of you saw you created this technology for your own publications and it eventually dawned on you, hey, we have this great technology. We can only scale so fast. Let's scale in a different way by basically licensing out this technology so other publications can launch on their own. And that's the letterhead that you keep on referencing. When did you launch that? And like, what was your strategy for in terms of recruiting people to uh, launch on your platform? So we started working on Letterhead um, right after COVID hit, uh, which is somewhat unintentional. We had sort of, since the later part of 2019, had a lot more conversations with people who were building newsletters uh, who would reach out to us and be like, hey, I like your newsletter. How do you do it? What tools do you use? And we'd be like, oh, we built our own stuff. And people would be like, yeah, can I, can I use those? Or is that something people can use? And we're like, no, we're not doing that. And we just, we said no a whole lot. We're like, we're saying no to this thing a lot <laughs> that people seem to want. 
you know, that's bad business of us. Like, is there a business here? And so we went and did some research and tried to learn what the space looked like. And, you know, everyone has an email tool already if you're sending newsletters. So why make another one? That was our starting disposition. And we just went out and did enough research to learn. Yeah, all these tools largely are built for a different use case are pretty good at that use case. But if you're making a content product, if you're a publisher, if you're trying to build a community around email, it's actually really hard to do that with a marketing tool. It's not built for it. So you're doing the same stuff we were doing, hacking it together, right? And that was where the genesis of Letterhead came from. I think our, our second thing was, uh, to your point, we see a lot of people, oh, I have this tech, here's this side business, right? Um, side businesses are super hard. And if I'm a customer, do I really want to be relying on someone's side hustle uh, for, for my business to run? And that was the kind of second question that we asked, right? And we felt that it was really important talking to a lot of publishers that it was a separate business, right? That we, it was a separate division of our company, separate team, separate thing, separate name. It, that it is its own business that operates independently. It's not a side hustle, like it is just a separate thing. So that we internally and externally could be really committed to, this is a software business. And there's really nothing to do with where by us other than we learned a bunch of stuff doing that that helps us make this product better. So we tried to be really intentional about that as well. And we spent uh, basically the second half of 2020 building out the software, testing it with some early partners who were willing to come on and mess with it and use it when it sucked and, and try it out. And then in uh, late December, we launched uh, publicly uh, and have been onboarding folks since then. And is it like a sub stack where anybody can just go and sign up or do you have to re actively recruit partners? What's the, what's that relationship look like? Yeah, our goal is really to serve operating businesses and teams, right? So we have some customers who are like coming to us from something like Substack because they're getting a little bit too big for that. It's become more of a, a larger business at this point and you need uh, custom HTML and APIs and ways to kind of scaffold out uh, more broadly than what you can get on a, on a free platform like a Medium or a Substack. Um, so we sort of sit at a different place. So mostly we're working with teams and publishers. Sometimes the teams are super small, but teams and publishers like operating business where they've got a need to, to plug this in or, or get email uh, either created or monetized as a part of their business. That's what we do. So we make these business tools, help you monetize, sell ads, uh, sell sponsorships, create the content, get it out, you know, in a way that's built exactly for editorial publishers rather than for a marketing use case. Um, we up until now have been recruiting publishers. You can't just come on our site and sign up and create an account because um, there is a subscription fee for Letterhead. But we actually are rolling out uh, here depending on when this publishes, uh, have already rolled out uh, a new program called the Starter Plan, which is a completely free version of Letterhead uh, that's designed to help uh, smaller teams and folks who are just getting started uh, monetize and create their newsletters uh, completely free. So we give them some of the basic ad tooling and sponsorship stuff that we do uh, and a whole lot of coaching and support and guidance from our team, uh, hands-on and in like recorded and group stuff uh, to help them learn how to build a business strategy around their newsletter. And that's uh, free. We just have a, a small transaction fee on revenue that they do through the platform. So uh, that's launching imminently or has already launched. Uh, and uh, we're excited to be bringing on some smaller publishers with that because we've we've heard in equal measure uh, from a lot of folks who are just getting started or really at the beginning stages of their journey and are looking for help and support and guidance. What do I do next? How, how, sh how should I charge for my ads? How do I build a good relationship with an advertiser? A lot of this stuff is really hard and expensive uh, to learn when you're starting out. And we have uh, fortunately and unfortunately learned a lot about that. Uh, uh, over the years and uh, want to help kind of pass that on to folks who are at the beginning stage of their journey. Why not completely just for all the partners, just go revenue share? Like if, you know, whenever, whenever someone buys an ad using your self-service platform, you take a cut. Whenever someone becomes a member, you take a cut, but it sounds like you're, even though you do sort of do that with the, with the, this new product, it, your main monetization is just charging like a fee of some sort. I think there are a couple of reasons for that. One is that as you grow your business, the take rate starts to become kind of significant, right? When you look at the platforms that are charging, you know, uh, 10, 15, 20%, whatever. And, you know, like this is in the, in the virtual event space too, for example, you have this where uh, you can start out for free and there's a, a revenue share cut there. But if you want to build out a bigger business, you know, you're going to look at that number and be like, oh, wait, this is like way too much. I'd rather just pay a subscription. Um, so there's an extent to which it's about helping publishers uh, control costs, right? 
um, it just makes a lot more sense. And it makes sense for us to have that recurring revenue and therefore be able to essentially make less, uh, but have it be reliable and for publishers to have less taken out of their, uh, out of their revenue when they're really operating at scale. So um, that's, that's part of it. And then the other piece of it for us is I think there's a mentality around providing business to business software that people have to pay money for that really forges your product in a different kind of fire. You have to be good enough. You have to offer enough value that if someone's not on our starter plan, that they're paying for it, right? That it's like, yeah, this is worth it to my business and it's providing enough value. There are a lot of free tools that they are free, which is great, but you have a lot of drop off and churn and, uh, and so forth because there's not the same kind of connection point to is it delivering enough value may or may not be right you have a lot of users on there kind of like dead or they come in and out and if what you're trying to build is a big platform for yourself that can be really helpful but if what you were trying to build is business tools that help somebody else with their business you just you never see that right there's no other category where uh, you see people like this is a tool for your business to help you make more money and, and grow and thrive that costs nothing, right? Um, except a, a percentage on the back end. It's just it's pretty uncommon except for like payment processors. Um, and I think there's a there's a mentality for both sides that's really healthy about, you know, hey, we're hiring you to do this job. All right. Um, that I find really useful for our team as well. Yeah, it's also good for support. Like I one of the biggest complaints about Substack is because they kind of uh, you know, don't charge like a set rate. They kind of have to, any kind of support tickets that go through, they have to kind of treat them all equally for someone who's only generating like $5 a month for them to someone who's, char- who's you know, generating a thousand dollars a month for them. And, uh, totally. and you can, and there's no way to really triage that. Whereas if you're acting like a traditional SaaS company where they're charging money and there's like a, uh, it, you know, it's, it, there's an actual barrier to entry, then when they do have problems, you can actually give them the, the care and support and attention they actually, you know, need and deserve. Yeah, I think that's a huge thing. And and we found that the support element is really critical. I and mean, part of that is like, you know, customers are hiring, even the starter plan customers who aren't paying us, right, our uh, subscription fee. Everyone's hiring us for help growing their, their media business. Like that is what we're in the business of doing. And so part of our goal is how do you build the business model in such a way that everyone feels good about how that's being, how money's being transacted there, but that we also are able to not compromise on that, right? Because to your point, uh, I think we've all had the experience of using something where you're like, maybe this tool is good, but God, the support sucks. And yeah. and that could be like so much more meaningful than, than the tool itself. Because particularly if I'm running ads in my newsletter, I need to deliver for this advertiser. I'm literally sending a newsletter and need to make sure it goes out the door. Like these are critical mission critical functions. And if the support is bad, you're like, well, this risks the stability of my business. Like it's just a different thing. And that's part of, uh, you know, it took us a little while initially to figure out who who is Letterhead for specifically and to feel really confident in that. But the reason we say this is for, you know, people who are building an actual business, right? It's, it's This is not the best tool for someone who's like writing as a side hustle. Like it's just not the right tool for you. There are a bunch of great tools for that. And we refer people to those all the time. If you're trying to build a business out of it, your needs are different. And one of those is like, I need it to be reliable. I need the support to be good. Uh, and I need to know that, you know, that they are invested in my business as their number one priority, um, not in their own business. And that's the problem, I think, with a lot of these free content publishing platforms is that they're trying to build their own platform and network and thing more like a social network. Um, and that means that is your business their top priority? It may not be. That's just not what they're doing. And that's OK. They're making a different contribution to the ecosystem. But um, that's something we saw was really important to publishers. And, and I think we also, having been publishers ourselves, it's really important to us to be able to sleep at night. Like we have been sold the false bills of goods by vendors in the media space before. We've been down that path. And so one of the thing, kind of things we sat around and made a commitment to each other about is like, let's try to avoid doing that if we can help it. Because uh, we know what it's like to get burned as a, as a customer. So that's been a really a fun part of this is like having been our own customer before. Um, we have this sense of like, okay, how do you do this in a way that that is going to make sense for those publishers? And then we still have a ton to learn, a lot of improvements, but it's been fun to kind of carry that in into it and and feel like, hey, um, you know, we can try to do this in a, in a better way. And it's still much too early to really assess it. You know, you don't have any like huge success stories yet just because you just launched like a few months ago, I'm guessing. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, we've got some fun milestones that we're excited about, right? We just passed 30K in monthly revenue uh, for Letterhead, which is really fun. Uh, we're serving, oh, I guess, almost four dozen publishers now at the time of recording. Um, and, you know, we're getting we're getting some fun folks aboard from really small folks who are starting out their newsletter and have like five or 200 subscribers to, you know, bigger folks who have half a million readers. Um, and seeing that range is really fun for us as well. So there's some of those things that we're super excited about. But yeah, it's definitely early. Uh, you know, right now we're in this moment where we've got our authoring and our promotions tools. They're out there, they're released. We're working with customers on those. And now we're starting to build out the next set of features um, around analytics and, uh, you know, a couple other revenue channels and so forth to help folks uh, kind of bring bring the whole business around their email into one tool. Um, and that's really our goal. So there's a lot of heads down building happening as well right now. Well, maybe we can have you on again in like a year once you can really talk, you know, dive into some of these businesses that have grown on your platform. I'd love to do it. I either we'll be uh, we'll have some awesome success stories to share, or we'll have some awesome lessons in uh, what what not to do, which often are are just as valuable. Okay, Christopher. Well, those were all the questions I had for you. Where can people find you online? Yeah, you can find me at CK Sofer on Twitter. I'm Chris at TriLetterhead.com. If you want to chat, uh, we'd love to hear from folks. Happy to just talk shop, uh, not necessarily to sell you anything. But of course, if you are working on a newsletter and trying to build a business around it, we'd love to help. That's what we're here for. And uh, if you are in one of our cities, uh, check us out at whereby.us. We'd love to see you on our newsletter. Awesome. Well, this is a lot of fun. Thanks for joining me. Thank you. Okay, thanks for joining us. I'm actually on the lookout for new guests for this podcast. So if you do interesting stuff in digital content, whether you're you're a full-time YouTuber, a media executive, or run a cool niche newsletter, definitely reach out. My email address is simonowens at gmail.com. Okay, see you next week.